welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited to have you join us in this conversation. We have the amazing award-winning Jason Wolf, sports uh, reporter, um, specifically involved in investigations with the Arizona Republic and the USA Today Network. Jason, welcome back, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate you having me back on. I'm very excited to be a repeat guest. You know, it doesn't happen very often, but I was so taken with your work, what you were doing. We had you on prior to the Super Bowl um, last, well, earlier in the year, talking about uh, professional athletes and all of the, this connection to the nonprofit sector, especially through the NFL. You had some fascinating things that were going on. And so, I can't wait to hear what's been cooking in your world. Um, before we get going, I want to make sure that we thank all of our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, and 180 Management Group. We also have an amazing group of co-hosts, and I'm sure that you will have been enjoying them as much as I have. But today I'm flying solo because I wanted it to be all about Jason Wolf and all of the questions that I have. Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Okay, Jason Wolf, woo, award winning, award winning. You've racked up a lot more awards since this investigative report came out. Talk about what life's been like for you. Uh, it's been wonderful to see the recognition that this project has received. Uh, the last time I was on, the last time that we spoke uh, was in advance of the Super Bowl this year in Las Vegas. And the project that we're discussing um, was called Mismanagement of the Year. We published it uh, the previous year before the Super Bowl here in 2023 in Phoenix. And, uh, you know, it, it was a groundbreaking deep dive, essentially, into the nonprofits founded by Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year Award winners. And for those of you in the audience that are unfamiliar with the award, this is the most prestigious individual award given out by the NFL. Uh, one NFL player a year receives it. There are 32 nominees, one for each team. Uh, it celebrates an athlete for his uh, philanthropy and community service. Uh, this has been given out every year since 1970, but over the last decade, decade and a half, it, it's turned into a really big deal. It's become uh, the centerpiece or one of the centerpiece awards for the annual NFL Honors Award Show, which takes place the week of the Super Bowl. Um, there's a tremendous uh, amount of advertising and marketing behind it, as you can sure. imagine. Uh, the winner ends up receiving uh, not only the trophy, uh, but a patch to wear on his jersey, on his chest for the rest of his career, and a quarter million donation, a quarter million dollar donation to his charity of choice, which more often than not is the charity he himself has founded. Now, uh, each of the runner ups receives $40,000 a $40,000 donation to the charity of choice. So there's a lot of money involved in this. There's a lot of marketing involved in this. It, it's overwhelmingly a positive thing, mm -hmm. right? Um, but my investigation into the efficiency of the nonprofits founded by these esteemed men reveals that many of them are, are far more inefficient than even the athletes themselves realize. And by speaking to professionals in the field, um, accountants, lawyers, specifically in the nonprofit field, right? Yeah, because there's yeah. a big difference. Uh, uh, most people don't realize right. the distinction between the nonprofit world and the business world and how very different it can be from a legal standpoint, from an accounting standpoint, right? We're able to um, come up with or, or at least incorporate some best practices right? To not only point out where athletes were falling short, but to show best practices. Um, and so these guys could just be educated, right? Them and their families, they, they, they want to do well. And, and the thing I found out that I guess heartened me more than anything, made, made me feel really good. You know, I got the opportunity to speak to nearly a dozen of these guys, superstar players over the course of a six month organization, 
And I was really grateful for that. They all have you know, layers of gatekeepers. You can't just walk up and, and, and talk to these guys. Mm-hmm. Our political reporters who I'm friends with who are shocked, you know, they can get a senator on the phone like that, but I can't get the quarterback of, you know, the NFL team. And, <laughs> and it's stunning. But so, you no, know, so many of these guys, they want to be held accountable. They want to learn. And, and a large problem that I've encountered is that so much of this industry in the sports philanthropy space is actually run and managed by marketers as opposed to actual nonprofit professionals. And many of them don't know what they don't know either. So right. um, since that published, it has, and we last spoke, uh, the project has received a, ra- a raft of national awards and attention, which is, you know, wonderful because, I mean, not only are awards, uh, you know, not not only is that recognition from my peers spectacular, but it also gives me a platform to continue to discuss this issue and, and you know the importance uh, the importance of of you know getting this done right and doing it well because ultimately we're we're trying to help as many people as possible. You know what I found so interesting when I first met with you. Um, it took me back because in order to do this investigative work you had to learn you know the nomenclature you had to dig down into what the 990 does and how it's presented and how it's worked and all of these things which you you lightly touched on but i would love if you could share that kind of process with us because the origin of your education and your own knowledge i mean you know everything about sports that's what your career has been um, and I would imagine that's what your your life is like, your personal life and your professional life, all sports oriented, then to go and pivot into something that is is really mystifying for a lot of people, even in the nonprofit sector. Right. Sure. Sure. I mean, talk about that, because I think that's very interesting. So so the the story behind the story behind the story, <laughs> which, which which you're familiar with, um, you know, over the last 10 years or so, I have. Um, you know, I, I've bounced around the country a little bit. I was uh, the NBA beat reporter for the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, then I was an NFL beat reporter covering the Tennessee Titans in Nashville. Uh, then I was a columnist and enterprise reporter for the Buffalo News, primarily covering the Buffalo Bills for many years before uh, coming here to Phoenix. And, you know, this story, my nonprofit reporting journey begins as the beat writer for the Tennessee Titans when I was working on a profile story about their star player, uh, Delaney Walker, who is uh, highly engaged in the nonprofit space. Um, I had printed out, I had known enough to know that 990s at the federal tax returns were public records and that I could get my hands on them. But once I printed them out, I had no idea what I was looking for. Right, how to right? read it. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I. I put one of those large clips on this stack of 40, 50 pages, and I'm walking around the newsroom and trying to find people who could help me read what was within this document, or at least point me to an expert that could help. And it was a struggle. And, you know, it didn't work out when I was in Tennessee. We ran the story. Um, It it really didn't touch on, um, you know, the, the ins and outs of how Delaney Walker's nonprofit worked. Right. But we ran a great profile. Um, I ended up taking the job for the, the Buffalo News. Um, and I, I didn't let this idea go. Right. Um, this is where the story really took off. And, and my education in the nonprofit space really took off. Um, and, and the event actually occurred before I joined the Buffalo News. It was on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2017 a game between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Baltimore Ravens when then Bengals quarterback Andy Dalton threw a last minute touchdown, right? right? The Bengals beat the Ravens. Um, and the effect that, that had was it knocked Baltimore out of the playoff race and it put the Buffalo Bills into the postseason for the first time in 17 years, yeah. right? breaking the longest, what was then the longest playoff drought in North American pro sports. Well, Bell, Bills fans, Bills fans, um, you know, uh, the city is known as they're known as the city of good neighbors, right? And as a fan base, they really embrace philanthropy and donating to their favorite athletes. And so, 
um, it was incredibly important for this community. What, what they did, what Bill Stans did was they donated nearly a half a million dollars, largely in $17 increments to any yeah. nonprofit, yeah. right? So just a little bit of money, yeah. right, from each person turned it into a huge mountain of cash, unsolicited, that was going to this NFL players nonprofit, right, mm -hmm. to ostensibly help sick children. Mm -hmm. And the My, 17, the 17 was his jersey number, correct? Well, or no, no, it was the year. no, 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 this, this, that came later. The 17 was for the 17 year playoff crowd. Right, right, right. Okay. Gotcha. gotcha. Right? Okay, there, gotcha. there was another incident uh, later. And, and, and that's important to understand that this continues to recur. These types of yeah. um, unsolicited yeah. viral, right. Giving yeah. this happens not only within, um, you know, Bill's mafia, as the Buffalo Bills fans are, are known as, but we saw it nationally with DeMar Hamlin, yes. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so this occurs, what you're referring to is uh, Josh Allen, the quarterback wears number 17, and Bills fans similarly donated in $17 increments when they found out his grandmother died before an amazing performance um, against the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, they donated nearly a million dollars in $17 mm -hmm. increments to the local children's hospital that he supports. Mm -hmm. So and it's important to recognize Josh yeah. Allen. Um, he doesn't have his own nonprofit. He 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 partnered directly with the children's charity, it, with, with the children's hospital in Buffalo. So the money goes directly there. Cuts out all of the all of the the middleman essentially, right? Yeah. When I mean, yeah. so much of what we're talking about, uh, or, or that I've learned, is that when athletes form their own nonprofit organizations, they're largely just collecting money to then pass off to an actual yeah. nonprofit that does programmatic work, yeah. right? Like a food bank or, or a children's yeah. hospital or whatever else. They might give out turkeys at Thanksgiving or take kids on shopping sprees, you know, around the holidays, but they're, they're raising money to give to a nonprofit. And so much of that money that they raise often just gets chewed up in the gears mm -hmm. and they don't realize it. The donors don't realize it. Um, and in many cases, less than 50 cents of every dollar donated ends up going to the people who the nonprofit is set up to help. And so, so, so that is a shocking thing. And I, and I want to go back to that because you've shared so many interesting things with us, but this notion that possibly as much as 50% of that donation really goes to the cost of operating that athlete's organization or the management of it, um, you know, the things that, that occur before that money actually is employed is a significant thing to consider. Um, because I think most people in the spirit of sport or engagement would never think that, right? These well, my investigation in Buffalo showed that uh, in the, the for-profit nonprofit management company that ran Andy Dalton's nonprofit was contractually entitled to, uh, it was like 22 and a half cents of every dollar raised, regardless of whether they had a, a hand in raising the money, along with 20% of in-kind donations, along with you know a bunch of other things. And so it essentially meant that this company, this for-profit company was pocketing a quarter of every dollar donated. So yeah. when Bill's fans donated, it was $442,000 to Andy Dalton's nonprofit this for-profit company took a hundred grand off the top. Yeah, yeah. And nobody nobody knew about that, knew. right? And it, it's one thing if you advertise that, if you're upfront with people that this is how it works, yeah. but if people don't know, right? And, and this company mm -hmm. um, managed many players, nonprofit organizations, mm -hmm. including two former winners of the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year Award, which mm -hmm. is how you can see that Buffalo project then led to me coming here to Phoenix and then working on the mismanagement of the year project, which was essentially what I did in Buffalo times 10. Right? Amazing. Looking at the past 10 nonprofits. Yeah. Created by winners of that award. So then let's flash forward and talk about sport for impact, because I think this is one of the gems that has come out of your hard work and um, which is, is really amazing. And so talk about that. And, and, and talk about what what really you've seen and, and what's going forward with this. Yeah, you, you know, all the national awards have been incredible, right? The Society of Professional Journalists, 
investigative reporters and editors, Associated Press sport ed sports editors, the Society of uh, or, or the Society for Features Journalism, um, Pro Football Writers of America. It goes on and on and on. But the most wonderful thing that has come out of this work has been Anquan Bolden, uh, co-founding Sport for Impact. Anquan Bolden uh, is a former Arizona Cardinals star wide receiver. He's a former NFL superstar. He is a former Walter Payton Man of the Year Award winner himself. Um, he is one of the guys that I interviewed along with his wife, Dion, along with his management people, um, Angela LaChica at um, the uh, Players Coalition, which he helped co-found. Um, they were so moved by this project. They shared with me their experiences in the nonprofit space, how he and his wife originally founded a nonprofit organization and found that it was only giving 25 cents of every dollar to actual mm. charity. And the vast majority of the money was being chewed up in the gears. Um, so they started there, um, ended up founding another nonprofit organization where they donated a million dollars of their own money uh, to endow a scholarship fund. And now after my project has run, they've co-founded Sport for Impact, which is a fiscal sponsorship organization mm -hmm. aimed at educating players and their families about responsible sports philanthropy, how to do this right, how to do this well. And there are other organizations, other similar organization fiscal sponsorships out there Mm -hmm. obviously, but this is the first one that actually has a Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year Award winner behind it as a mm -hmm. co-founder. Um, he's a headline grabber. Uh, he he has connections throughout the sport. The yeah. Jacksonville Jaguars are the first NFL team to provide them with a grant, and it is my understanding that Anquan Bolden and Sport for Impact um, will be or have been invited to speak to the team in the locker room before the season this year. Awesome. We won other teams, right? So um, the way that they're, this organization is, is going about its mission is, you know, not necessarily to address the public, mm -hmm. but to leverage the connections that it already has within the sport and go directly to the players themselves and their family members. And they might not listen to you or me or, or read what's in the newspaper, right? Or, or see this or, or, or be watching the nonprofit show, but they universally respect Anquan Bolden. And no. when he's standing there and, and telling you the same things that we're talking about, that resonates. And yeah. so it's incredible to have been able to essentially have inspired some people who matter, right? Yeah. To attempt to do something that matters, to, to agree with the findings and be like, you know what? Yeah, you're talking about my experience too. This is happening. This continues to happen for decades. Um, I spoke to Troy Vincent, NFL senior vice president and a former Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year award winner himself. And he credited my investigation with you know, exposing this issue, which he says, you know, has, has been a recurring issue for decades, sure. right? Sure. The, yeah. the sports philanthropy field is dominated by marketing instead of actual nonprofit experts and guys who want to do well, you know, instead they get the right marketing material put in front of them. They rely on an ex, they, they rely on their agent or, or their marketing mm -hmm. rep to get the right material mm -hmm. put in front of them. They don't know what they don't know. And their job mm -hmm. is to play a sport well or they don't have the platform that they have to make this difference. Right. You know, and, and it, I right. think too, the people around them more so than yeah. the athletes themselves. Yeah. And I think too, you know, it's, this is not an issue that is unique to professional sports. You know, there's a redemptive quality or a marketing quality big time in, in philanthropy, you know, organizations want to get behind a winning concept or a benevolent concept. So this is, this goes beyond the borders of just athletes. Um, and so to show this and to really get everybody talking, I think is just magical. And, and I really, I applaud you for this because this is going to make um, a lot of things change. We don't have a lot of time left, but in the time that we do, can you give us like a current status of what's going on and, and what you 
think is going to be changing because as we navigate forward and every time there's a conversation, um, we, we learn more and, and we, we get chatting about it. So what are you seeing and what are you forecasting? Right. So, so what's been happening since February, along with the, the national recognition through awards, which is uh, allowing me to continue to uh, deliver this message here today. I've also spoken uh, to hotel ballrooms full of reporters at the Society of Professional Journalists National Convention Great. Uh, and the Investigative Reporters and Editors National Convention, educating reporters about mm -hmm. these issues and showing them how they can use public records so they can do this type of reporting in their own communities, right? Like I can't do this alone. And to your point, it's not exclusive about sports. Um, the wonderful thing about sports, and, and I always share this with reporters at SBJ and IRE, who you know, by and large are not sports reporters, right? They're very right. serious reporters. It's the thing I love about sports journalism is that sports touches on society in innumerable ways. Right. And this is just one of them. And if you can tell a story about something that matters through the prism of sports, mm -hmm. you have a built in audience in which you can essentially force feed people their vegetables. Right. <laughs> and, and, and that's what I kind of try to do. Right. Like I want to write sports stories that matter and, and that inspire change. And so. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've spoken at SBJ, I've spoken at IRE. I'm trying to essentially, you know, raise a small army of, yeah. of reporters to continue on and, and do these types of stories in their own markets. Um, because there are so many target audiences here, right? There's the players and the families themselves. There's the donors. There's the league and, and the agent and the marketers who are looking at, are supposed to be looking out for these guys, right? Mm -hmm. Um and, and, and then, of course, getting anything to actually change on, on a macro level, you know, it, it's hard and, and it's not going to happen with one or two stories. And, and to that point mm -hmm. is the winner of the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year Award this year was Pittsburgh Steelers defensive lineman Cameron Hayward. OK, good guy means well, first round draft pick like like all the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award winners. And I don't want to insinuate in any way that he is not worthy of that award, okay? He right. gives back to the community, right? Yeah. He, he's a leader. Um, the problem is, you know, within less than an hour of him receiving the award, I'm able to go on the IRS website and see that his 501c3 status had been revoked. His nonprofit mm -hmm. C3 status had been revoked for mm -hmm. failing to file federal tax returns for three consecutive years. Right. Okay. Like you right. dig a little bit further and you realize that this nonprofit, ha which, you know, it is one of the primary reasons why he's receiving this award, mm -hmm. according to all of the marketing behind it and the presentation when, when he's given uh, the thing on national television, you know, you dig a little deeper and it shows that he, his nonprofit not never registered to solicit donations with the Pennsylvania Secretary of State as right. required by law. And then of the 990s that were filed, you know, the, the prior year and the pre the, the prior year and the current year numbers, you start to line up 990s and they don't match. So there ended up being tens of thousands of dollars that were either missing or unaccounted for. And so, you know, I didn't just put him and his nonprofit on blast. You know, I reached out to him and his representatives, his mother runs the nonprofit, which is not unusual and not Correct. necessarily a bad thing right. either. Okay. Right. And if a family member is qualified to run a nonprofit, then I mean, there are countless examples of, of this working well, okay. Mm -hmm. And being efficient, but his mom ran the nonprofit. She didn't know what she didn't know. I end up finding out that keep in mind, he was a first round NFL draft pick. This is not some nobody that climbed up, you know, through, Right. This is a guy who was uh, essentially supposed to be a star from the start. Um, mm -hmm. And it turns out that when he founded his nonprofit organization, his mother relied on a friend of the family that did personal income taxes to do the to do the nonprofits, you know, yeah. tax returns. And yeah. the guy just stopped at some point in time. And that wasn't 
adequately communicated to the leadership at the nonprofit. So they don't even know that they're not right. submitting their 990s or that they're supposed to, right? right? So, I mean, is that a, that that's your Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year award winner. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of a shame because you want to point to a nonprofit. You want to, you don't want to be able to point to a guy and say that this nonprofit has been revoked, right? It's done a lot of great things, but right. the reason, but but there's also a distinction between community service and philanthropy, right? And, yeah. and, and these athletes are forming tax exempt nonprofit organizations. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about that money and the tax exempt status and how efficient it can be. Because it, it, it doesn't cost a dime of the public's money for an athlete to go visit sick kids and sick children in a hospital, mm -hmm. right? But it is the community's money when you're raising it for a cause and then more than half of it is, you know, going to, you know, pay your employees as opposed to going to help those sick kids. Right. And if the, the employees aren't aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing and that the fiduciary trust is broken or not. And then the NFL is going to give a hundred thousand dollar grant and, and yeah. hold this player and his nonprofit up as being. Yeah you know, the pinnacle of excellence on and yeah. off the field. And, you know, mm -hmm. I, these guys, they can be better. They want to be better. I, mm -hmm. They all agree. Like none of them got to where they are in life by showing up to the practice field with their helmet and pads on backwards, right? And getting a <laughs> pat on the helmet and being told, good job. No, they, they're the best in the world at what they do because they've worked yeah. hard at it, because they yeah. understand the ins and outs in the game and because they've dedicated themselves to being mm -hmm. great. Right. The idea here is to not just stop at charity and think, oh, charity equals good, because we know that's not exactly the case. Right. I love that you have uh, woven this picture for us, that you stayed on this, um, that you've taken this story across the trajectory of your own career. It's really, really amazing. I, I can tell you as someone in the nonprofit sector advocating for our sector, you know, we see all different types of problems. And generally we see problems that are mismanagement oriented, right? They're not necessarily, you know, the evil, you know, I'm going to steal money kind of thing. It's just generally an inability to understand the structure and how it works legally, right? Correct. And then managing that um, when you don't know anything about it, right? You know, intrinsically that philanthropy is good and charitable giving is good and public service is good and all that, but that's not it. That's just the first layer. And I think you've done such a beautiful job of, you know, uncovering that and explaining it. And more than anything, Jason, I'm super proud of you for going out and really educating yourself on tough stuff because these things are not easy, even for people within the nonprofit sector. So kudos to you for really, um, taking that 990 to heart. And I know from talking with you off camera, you know, you really um, were able to get folks to educate you about the nomenclature for the, the tax code, the processes, what it looks like, um, what, what somebody should be thinking about when they invest or they donate uh, with a nonprofit. So really cool that you've been doing this. Um, we look forward to seeing what's next on your horizon. Check out Jason Wolf, sports investigative reporter, the Arizona Republic and USA Today Network. AZCentral.com is the publication uh, website. But you are very active and you have a robust uh, social media process, a platform that you work, Jason, so you can also connect with Jason that way. Really exciting stuff. Good job, my friend. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is definitely eye-opening, but not necessarily controversial, right? Like everybody more or less wants the same thing, right? And it's to help yeah. as many people as possible, for nonprofits to be as efficient as possible. And so it is wonderful to have the athletes themselves buy in because that's how you begin to actually get through the people and have some change. Yeah, well, you've been a big part of that. And um, we are thrilled that we got you on to the nonprofit show to, to, be, to be talking about this. So thank you. Thank you ever so much. We also want to give a big shout out of gratitude to our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, 
Fundraisers Friday and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Okay, you know, Jason, I sign off every day with this, this uh, saying, and I'm speaking to you, my friend, because you have a lot of work you have to do for us and represent us in the nonprofit world. And the saying is this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you again, everybody. Thank you.